Excellent. Well, it's, my, it's my complete pleasure to be here. I, I really am excited about what you guys are doing and to be able to participate in it. Um, and so the opportunity to get my words in edgewise, um, it's inspired by something that we've all done in private uh, at one time or another, but we rarely talk about it in public. Um, it's, well, you know, you, you know, you know you've done it and you know that you're going to do it again. <laughs> It's titillating, it's addictive, and every time it's different when you do it. And I'm actually going to ask for a show of hands uh, from all of you. How many of you have ever Googled yourself? <laughs> Don't be shy. Yeah, well, so sure, it, it might be a bit narcissistic, but I think all of us are rightly curious about what can be found out about us with a few keystrokes. But more than idle curiosity or even vanity, I think for a host of reasons that it's important to know what's out there um, about us uh, in the, the great big digital world. Um, you know, some of it we put there ourselves, but some of it uh, comes as a total surprise. The point being that whether we realize it or not, we're leaving behind these kinds of digital legacies, um, whether that's that decades old Usenet um, group posting that you did or uh, your latest tweet or Facebook status update. So um, in light of this gaggle of self-Googlers, uh, what I want to talk about is the future of nostalgia because I want to explore the connections between the ways we already remember our lives and construct our, our identities, and the ways we might in future remember our stories now that increasing portions of our lives are being lived and shared online. But first of all, uh, I want to share some examples of nostalgia. Um, show and tell is not just for kindergarten, but this one does come with a warning. <laughs> Example number one. <laughs> the rotary phone. The, you know, the, the weight of it, I mean, you haven't used this in years, but the weight of it, the, the feel, the sound. I plugged it in the other day to make sure it actually works and that I think the, the ring almost made me jump off my seat, but it, it works. It's, it's like a little crackly, but I remember the days when, you know, there's this, this clarity um, in the quality of the calls. So rotary phones, that's my, that's one example. Um, what else do we have in this box of magic? <gasps> <laughs> the Viewmaster. So, oh, it's Tweety and Sylvester. And the, the quality of the, the images, you know, they got Dumbo, I got the Aristocats. Um, but yeah, again, it's like the sound of it, the feel, Something else that makes me nostalgic. The smell of Crayola crayons. 64 pack, sharpener in back. <laughs> and my eraser collection. <laughs> and again, it's, it's the smell, it's the feel, it's uh, not quite the taste, but, but you know. <laughs> You, you get the feeling, you get, the, you get what I'm trying to say here. The tangible objects of our lives, um, they're like portals to past experiences. Um, but, you know, not every object triggers the nostalgic response. And, you know, you might wonder, well, why might that be? And I think it's because of the emotional attachment and the associations that we create, because we are attachment-forming creatures, after all. Uh, and sometimes we're not aware of the attachment that we've made to something or somewhere until we've left it or lost it. Then what triggers it is uh, a sight, a song, a smell, um, or an object. Uh, because the, the thing about nostalgia is that it's sensual. It's highly personal, and it's not always obvious to others why certain triggers stick with you. Uh, it doesn't have to make sense. The power and the beauty of nostalgia is in the way that it elicits these emotional reactions, these visceral responses from you. 
Uh, nostalgia conjures up these warm fuzzies, but it's also mingled with that um, bittersweet longing um, and pangs of loss. So my box of nostalgia contains those things, some of those things that I showed you, but it also contains some things that are less tangible. For example, a screenshot from King's Quest I, um, which is one of the first uh, computer games that I ever played. We've got this, <laughs> <laughs> the screenshot of the Pine email reader. So back in the, the text-based internet days, this is, this is the first thing that I started out uh, using email with. The cool thing about digital triggers for nostalgia is that much of it can get archived online, as I've just demonstrated. I pulled it off the net the other day. So now you can watch as many episodes of Jim and the Holograms and the Transformers as you like on YouTube. <laughs> and you can even get choked up listening to the theme song of Family Ties. <laughs> if it can be digitized, it can be archived. And the net is great for preserving and circulating those aspects of memory and experience. And for my part, I had I was pangs all over the place just putting this presentation together. But uh, digital or analog, tangible or virtual, tied up in that experience of nostalgia is pain. Um, and here, let me give a shout out to the etymologists in the room who like to trace word origins. Uh, the Greek roots of nostalgia, for anybody who's interested. Uh, literally, the pain associated with returning home, nostos and algos. It's a type of homesickness in the very real sense of an affliction. Uh, throughout the 1700s and into the later 1800s, many Swiss soldiers and uh, members of Highland Scots regiments who were off fighting uh, in, the, in their wars um, were diagnosed with nostalgia, uh, which was this longing for home uh, while they were you know, suddenly and forcibly uh, displaced as they were fulfilling their wartime duties. Um, the sickness of their home, or the symptoms of their homesickness were quite real. You had constipation, um, stomach pain, insomnia, inability to concentrate, exhaustion, even suicidal thoughts. All of which are fitting descriptions, uh, clinical descriptions for melancholia and depression these days. Through the Victorian era, the, uh, the idea of nostalgia as a disease eventually transformed into something uh, more harmless and fleeting, um, the yearning for earlier times. And today it's even become something of a cultural aesthetic, uh, which is related to, but distinct from, um, our embrace of all things vintage and retro. You don't have to have a personal connection to, met, to the 60s to enjoy Mad Men, for example. But if you're trolling through Valley Village and you find a My Little Pony set, you might be drawn back to your childhood instantly. Um, appreciating retro styles, uh, like many of us do, it's a matter of taste. But actually feeling nostalgia is a matter of having formed that prior emotional attachment. So make no mistake. Um, unlike dabbling freely in the past the way you would with you know, vintage styles, in nostalgia, there's pain. And not just the pain of the present longing for the past, but also the anxiety of what a future return home might entail. Home is never really home by the time that you return. And here is a modern example. Google Street View. What's the first place that you searched for, for those of you who've been on Google Street View? Where you grew up. Where you grew up, your childhood home. And what did you feel? Well, in my case, um, when I checked on my childhood home, sure enough, there were pangs. It was enough to confirm a fundamental truth about nostalgia, which is this, that in trying to recapture or recreate uh, the experience, the return reveals that it's not what you thought it was, or more to the point, you're not who you were. 
Nostalgia at its core involves the loss of something, whether physically, like uh, as suffered the homesick Swiss soldiers, or temporally speaking, as we all grow up and away from our roots. And what's the point of nostalgia? You know, we all get caught up in it once in a while, but, but what's the point? Is it so much sentimentality? Is it so much, you know, wallowing in the past and getting schmaltzy and crying in your beer for, you know, longing for an ideal time that probably didn't exist? Or is there something more important going on here? Uh, I think idealized pasts or not, nostalgia stands guard as sentinel over our own stories, our identities, our self-integrity. We get nostalgic because we've formed emotional attachments to things and places that we associate with comfort and stability. But what happens to those emotions when we increasingly live in contexts that are ever-changing? And what happens when the things we get nostalgic about include the digital? When it comes to the future of nostalgia, I think there are a couple of things that might change how we amble down memory lane. One of those is the question of who controls entry onto memory lane. And the other is this. Will the constantly shifting, uh, upgradable digital landscape even make nostalgic attachment, uh, nostalgic emotional attachment in particular, possible in the first place? I used to print off my emails in the early days uh, because, you know, writing to friends and family, I'd do it in a very newsy, conversational style, treat it as a, another form of letter writing, and thought that they were worth preserving, like letters. But, you know, the more that I use email in my daily life, my inbox is burgeoning with an unsorted backlog of correspondence, some of it still poignant, but a lot of it mostly mundane. And much like the self-googling that I referred to at the beginning of this talk, uh, my email, my online photo albums, and even my Facebook profile reveal this digital legacy that's starting to pile up behind me. And I've gotten into wondering about the fate of all of that stuff. Um, what am I going to do with my digital stuff? Who's going to want it? Uh, and more startlingly, is it even my stuff? I think those questions get more complicated as we entrust our memories and our files to corporate custodians. For example, the difference between my box of nostalgia and some of my digital legacies is that for the digital legacies, I signed various end user license agreements. There was a recent episode of Spark on CBC Radio, which uh, touched upon what happens to our accounts online uh, when we die, because this is something that's becoming of increasingly uh, increasing importance and interest to people. Some of those accounts, they get locked. Some of them get deleted. Some are strictly non-transferable, uh, although others do allow family access with the proper documentation. The point is that beyond the legalese, that covers the termination of an end user license agreement. Many online services have not put a lot of thought into uh, their policies regarding our digital legacies until recently. And so these policies are constantly under development as service providers run into the very real, very human, and sometimes very messy situation of what to do with what remains of the deceased's digital self. Um, of course, it's hard to be nostalgic if you're dead, so uh, let's return to the question of the living. I'm entrusting my digital legacy to a distant corporation which operates with its own priorities and its own legal frameworks in mind. And corporate decisions, as we all know, impact our experience and even access to what we generally assume is our stuff. There's benefits and there's drawbacks from having distributed filed storage, um, just as there are benefits and drawbacks to having your, all your valuables in one place. I think, though, that in the digital world, we need to be much more aware who the gatekeepers of our files are. And 
and the gatekeepers of our memories and what the conditions of access to those files and memories are. Um, my box of nostalgia is mine. Um, you know, I have control over its contents and most likely I have control over the destiny of its contents, even if I decide to chuck it out to Robin Hood Bay at some point. I don't know. But the fate of my digital legacies, by contrast, is, is far more up in the air. I haven't decided what to do with them, or even what I can do with them, and the corporations that safeguard them haven't really got it figured out completely either. Now, I know that facilitating my nostalgia is probably not at the top of their checklists. Um, nostalgia isn't the be-all and the end-all of people's existence, but through the lens that I'm using, I hope that you can see that there's still a lot that needs to be addressed as we blithely go about constructing our digital selves and also leaving behind these digital footprints. The other factor that I alluded to earlier when we think about the future of nostalgia is the very pace and the nature of change in wired society. We expect change and we expect it'll be quick because there's always something new to be rolled out. Some of us are addicted to change, while others of us are more stubbornly resistant to it. But oftentimes we don't have much of a choice in the matter, and uh, the change often comes without much advance notice. Websites constantly get revamped. Operating systems and software get retooled. Gadget interfaces get upgraded. And great, you might say. I mean, doesn't nostalgia need change in order to exist as nostalgia? Yes but it also implicitly involves the ability to form these prolonged, stable associations and attachments. Uh, often, like I said, are, which are emotional and which are sensual uh, with things and places and people. What I want to ask is whether we can even form emotional attachments to things that change rapidly around us, especially in a digital context. Because we live in this funny tension of being creatures of habit and also novelty seeking. Um, I've had times when I've consciously resented some kind of imposed change, whether that was transitioning between Windows, uh, Windows XP and Windows 7, or having to physically move away. But nevertheless, um, I unconsciously adapt, and a familiar situation can become comfortable. Uh, they say that familiarity breeds contempt, but I don't think it does in this case. I think it breeds comfort, and with comfort comes attachment, and with attachment, maybe even nostalgia. But when things change quickly around us, and constantly without notice, what, what do we hold on to? Sometimes the resistance to change is strong enough for a corporation to respond to. Um, witness, for example, the backlash against Facebook when it tries to change its layout and everybody gets up in arms. Um, and some conciliatory measures that Facebook has taken in order to appease our need to preserve the familiar. But at the same time, the corporate attitude to criticism about change is often, shut up, you'll like it. Um, so my question is, should we be given the opportunity to preserve what we've become attached to. Uh, oftentimes we're simply not asked. And that's a strange thing to confront at the intersection of um, corporate change and your own kind of personal emotional investment in something. I know that no one's going to sell or chuck my Viewmaster, for example, without my permission. I know it's not going to change on me from day to day. But in the digital world, we get conflicting messages about what we can and can't do with the personal content that we're attached to and what the service provider can and can't do with it. Um, those rules are still changing, and we expect them to be for some time. So our, our relationship and our entitlement and our access to digital material proves different, even though our attachment to virtual things and places might actually be as strong as in the tangible world. What I do is study at the crossroads of science and technology and the humanities. 
And when I look around me and I ask, what does it mean to be a human being in a high-tech society? What I see are far more demands on us to be rapidly adaptable, uh, not just to continually upgrading technology, but also to the increasingly transitory nature of jobs, um, residences, and relationships even. Now, certainly, I might just be a curmudgeon, um, but I think the value of the nostalgic impulse is that it tells us something about ourselves, um, our, about our values and about our attachments. Just because we get used to change doesn't mean that we also don't want attachment. And what I'm asking is, where's the balance in the digital world? Might the digital age actually be impeding our ability to form those attachments? Where can we call home, at least, for a little while? Uh, maybe nostalgia can't bring you back home for good, either figuratively or literally. But it does mark the things that you've loved along the way. To long for is to have loved, and to have loved is to have been at home. And I think mulling over the future of nostalgia is really to mull over the kinds of beings we're becoming in the 21st century and what it is to feel at home in that world. And with that ponderous thought, I leave you. Thank you so much.